Welcome back everybody to Volatility Trading Strategies. So recently I put out a video just introducing a few option trading ideas that may be suitable for lower volatility environments because for anybody who's not aware, 2017 has arguably been the lowest volatility year in history. These are all the VIX index closes under 10 since 1990 with 2017 highlighted in blue. And as you can see, it's just a sea of blue. This year has pretty much filled out the entire table. Now it's true, the VIX calculation has changed a little bit over the years, so we can't just look to this measure alone. Plus, the VIX itself is a statistic measuring forward 30-day implied volatility, and sometimes expectations don't entirely align with reality. But here's the lowest S&P 500 historical volatility readings, which is the volatility the market actually experienced over the previous 20 trading days. And again, this year has seen some extremely low numbers. It's almost never been below 5%, let alone all these below 4% this year. We have to go back to the early 1970s to see many other values like this. We know it's now the second longest bull market in history, 102 straight months and counting. And the last one year of it has been especially calm. We're closing in on the all-time record for longest S&P 500 streaks without even a 3% correction. And without a 5% correction goes back many months further than that. Volatility has been almost entirely removed from these markets. Stocks just go in one direction now. No matter the news, no matter the risks, markets just refuse to drop. So yeah, a case can certainly be made that this year is one of, if not the lowest volatility year in history. And for option traders in general, this is bad news. I've done several articles and videos over the years talking about why being a net seller of options is by far the better position to be. And the higher the premiums you can bring in when you write the contract, the more insurance you're going to have against market declines. But there isn't any volatility to sell right now, which makes that risk-reward profile skewed to the downside. Now, sure, it's worked out well for anybody who dare try, say in the last six to eight months, but that doesn't change the fact that shorting volatility when it's historically low is always a low probability trade. So we need to be careful, and we definitely want to reduce our trade frequency until volatility comes back to these markets. But that doesn't necessarily mean we have to stop trading entirely. We just have to be very strategic with our entries. So first let me review the long vol trades that I highlighted in the last video, and then I'll introduce what I feel is a better way to navigate low volatility environments. Okay, so here we are inside the Thinkorswim platform. And I do have to apologize really quickly here. I am a pretty busy person, and lately my schedules just felt really jammed up. So I've got a few minutes here. I am recording in the middle of a Starbucks. Hopefully there's not too much background noise. There is some construction going on next door, so apologize for that. And as well, I may just sound a little bit nervous. I may be talking quickly. I'm not really sure, but at the end of the day, I am talking to myself in the middle of a room. So it's a little bit embarrassing, but I apologize for that. What we're looking at here... This is a five-year chart of the Russell 2000 Volatility Index, the RVX. This is basically the VIX for the Russell 2000. And where volatility is at right now today is actually a little bit lower than it was last week when we did the original trades. So since a little bit of time has passed and volatility has decreased, it won't be too surprising that those trades should be in a little bit of trouble right now. So let's check out where they're at. Now the first trade we highlighted was the long put option. And recall that I said, this is not a trade that I would ever take. In general, long puts and long calls, there's way too many variables involved here. Of course, we are long vega, which is the point of the video. That's what we're trying to get to. It is a strong long vega trade, but unfortunately, it is also very strongly delta negative. So very directional. We're exposed to the price movements. If this goes in the wrong direction, we could lose money very quickly. And as well, to make things worse, we are also theta negative. So every day that we're wrong and volatility doesn't rise or nothing happens in the markets, we're going to be bleeding capital. So far too many variables, actually long puts and long calls are just a non-starter. If they're being used as hedges, that's effective. If they're being used as risk reversal or stock replacement, they can also serve a value there. But as standalone trades, they're just non-starters. But results-wise, actually this trade didn't work out that badly. It's down about $300 right now. But as I've often talked about, sometimes in investing, option trading, volatility trading, sometimes bad trades make money. And sometimes good trades lose money. But that's just the result. We have to actually stay focused on the process. The process of opening only the good trades, 
staying in cash during all of the sketchy ones, and just letting the long-term law of large numbers take its course. So in the long run, of course, nothing matters more than results, but in the short run, results are fairly irrelevant. We want to stick to only the good trades, and this is just not a good trade. So a much better one was the iron condor. In this case, again, of course, we are Vega positive, which is what we want, and there was the negative effects of theta. It's going to be bleeding theta. Every day that we're wrong, we're going to lose money, but at least for this trade, it is fairly delta neutral, so we're not really worried about price movements in either direction. We are just focusing in on the Vega and the theta. But this trade is down $3,000, and the reason that happened is like I explained in the previous video, it is a little bit more exposed to the negative theta. I think sometimes one of the reasons people select iron condors is simply because the short iron condor, when volatility is elevated, shorting the iron condor is actually one of the best trades out there. So sometimes people think, well, why don't I just do the opposite when volatility is very low? I'll just do a long iron condor. But actually the exposure is a little bit too high, and I'm not a risky trader at all. I don't think it's necessary. I've been crushing the market for years, and I hold significant amounts of cash in my portfolio. We don't have to take risk to make money. So I will always select the safer trade. And in this case, as I said, I wouldn't have opened the iron condor. I would have actually opened the straddle instead. Dynamically, it's almost identical. Of course, we are long vega pretty significantly. And we are short theta, so we have to be careful. We can't just hold this trade indefinitely. But the exposure here is a little bit less than the iron condor, which is good. You can see here we're only down 1250 so it was far more resilient to this bad market environment that we saw in the past nine days. But even still, 1250 that's getting very close to the stop loss, so we do have to exit this trade. Now anytime you're trading long volatility, it's a very low probability trade, so allocation sizing, position sizing, and stop losses are vital to your success. Now there aren't any hard and fast rules, of course this is just a general guideline. But for me personally, I like to keep my position sizing about one third or one quarter what I normally would on the short side. And then I like to increase the stop loss by about three times or four times. So for example, when I'm trading short iron condors, I usually target a 5% stop loss. Of course, you don't always hit that. Sometimes markets move intraday a little bit quicker and it can blow right past your stop loss. You know, 5% can turn into 10 or 15 but I do feel like it's important to keep the initial stop loss very low to account for that. But on the long volatility side, trying to catch that spike is futile. It's like catching lightning in a bottle. So we have to allow ourselves to be wrong. If we just stop out every time it's 5%, we're just going to have a string of stop outs that's, you know, as long as the year goes on. So again, I will increase it by three or four times. I'll make sure that this trade is very small. This is only one contract. Of course, it's only a paper account, but even still, I would keep it extremely small to make sure that the impact of a wrong trade isn't going to kill us, and then I'm going to allow the stop loss a little bit more room to run. So on a $7,200 trade, assuming originally that is a very small amount, I will actually allow about $1,400 or $1,500 stop loss. We're getting close to that now. It wouldn't be a bad idea to just close this one out now, but another thing that I do like to allow myself is a follow-up trade. Now with option trading, we're going to have plenty of losing trades. That's just part of it. Fortunately, we'll have far more winners than losers. In the long run, it'll work out really well, but we will have losing trades. So the key is to just not string them together consecutively. You don't want to ever get anchored to a specific thesis and just ride it out to the end. So I'll allow myself a follow-up trade. I'll probably close this one, wait a day or two in between, and then open the exact same trade one more time. I probably just adjust the strike price to reflect that day's price. But other than that, it's going to be materially similar to this trade, and I'll do a follow-up. The follow-up trade will be the same, one-third, one-quarter the allocation size, three or four times the stop-loss size. And if that one fails, then it's just time to move on to a different thesis. In option trading, there's always good trades out there to take, so you never have to get anchored to one specific idea. We have to remember that famous Keynes quote, markets can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. We do feel like volatility is going to rise in the coming weeks, but we certainly can't time it correctly. Maybe it happens tomorrow, but maybe it doesn't happen till after Christmas. So we're not going to ride this thing into the ground. We're going to just do two trades and then move on. Now one thing that I did talk about in the previous video is even better than all of these trades, there is a better way to navigate low volatility environments, and that is the put calendar. 
I opened one on that same day just in preparation for this follow-up video and this is what that looks like. So just like with the other ones, of course it is long vega. And now we know that being delta neutral is important, so this trade qualifies as well. It's slightly delta positive, but it was neutral when we opened it. But the key difference with this trade, which differentiates it from the other trades that are losing money right now, is that this trade is actually theta positive. In this case, if markets tomorrow are the same as they are now, we would actually expect to make a little bit of money. You can see the pink line up here, we're theta positive about $36. So we no longer have that bleed to our trade. This is a powerful position to be in. This is why we love trading short iron condors so much. It's actually a positive dividend each and every day that nothing happens in the markets. Also, since we do keep our days to expiry very long, we are actually essentially gamma neutral as well. Gamma is a second order derivative of the first order delta. It basically estimates changes in delta with respect to changes in the underlying, in this case the Russell 2000. So structurally, this trade is far more similar to a short iron condor with the only difference being that it's actually long vega. So a rise in volatility will just be added insurance to the trade. And the results don't matter, these are just single trades. But you can see that this trade is up nearly $400 in the same time that these other trades were bleeding capital. And that's of course because nothing's happened, and we're just collecting that daily premium. So I love put calendars, but I guess a question people are probably asking, how and when to use them? So as a general checklist, again just for guidelines, since they are long vega, you definitely want to be using them in low volatility environments. Again, nothing I say should be construed as trading advice, but as a basic outline to get people started on their paper trading journey, if you sell iron condors during high volatility environments and you buy put calendars during low volatility environments, this would form a pretty good base for a solid strategy. Now how do we decide what high and low volatility means? I personally have a pretty massive spreadsheet and I track a lot more complicated indicators and thresholds, but as a very basic tool, you could actually use just a 52-week implied volatility percentile. So again, this is the Thinkorswim platform. I'm sure yours is similar. You can find this data somewhere. But for Thinkorswim, you go to today's option statistics under the Add Simulated Trades. If you click on that, it'll actually tell you a bunch of data that we can see. So implied volatility at 1425 and then it tells you the current historical volatility percentile, 10%. Remember, historical volatility is what's happened in the previous 20 trading days. But the one we're interested in is the current IV percentile. This number is just where volatility ranks in the last 52 weeks. Now, it's not enough to just check this because it can be skewed by very low or very high numbers. You can see the 52-week IV low got extremely low at 0.123. So that's why I track an extended list of indicators. Obviously, this is just a, a rough guideline. But as a general rule, it can get you started. So say rule of thumb, above 30% or so of IV rank, consider short iron condors. Maybe below 30%, that might be more suitable for long put calendars. And if you did want to add a third dimension, below, say, 5%, the really low volatility readings when we just see volatility just get stretched to the extreme, perhaps long at the money straddles, like the above example before. But only for the extremes, because this is never going to be a high probability trade. Anybody can be profitable in the short run when markets cooperate, but option traders who are successful in the long run have many tools at their disposal. Knowing when to trade iron condors, when calendars might be more suitable, or perhaps the occasional long vol straddle. These are all skills that need to be learned, and nothing beats experience. So I invite you to go ahead and open up a paper trading account and get started testing your ideas. Don't be afraid to be wrong, of course it is only a paper account, but one thing that is extremely vital to the process is record every trade. With real money, we don't get to say, oh that trade doesn't count because the Fed did something unexpected, or I don't include that month because markets were acting strange. Record every trade, both good and bad. And the truth is, we can learn a lot more from our failures than we do from our successes. So definitely include those and go back and analyze them when they happen, because they will happen. But if you can be profitable over the course of, say, one year, at that point you'd be ready for prime time. I'll continue to put out content and hopefully guide you in the right direction. But at the end of the day, everybody has to find their own style and develop their own strategies that work for them. So email me with any questions you have, and I'll see you all next time.
So go ahead and click the link right here, sign up for the VTS newsletter, and when you do, you're gonna get full access to all of my trading strategies for a full month absolutely free. And if you are new here, please consider subscribing to my channel. Also, if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and leave those in the comment section below. See you next time.